you listen, thanks for being here, and nobody brought lunch except myself. Um, so I, I don't know how or why that happened, but, uh, um, but we started this kind of idea of technovation talks, because um, we thought the technology and data and information really needs to be advocated, and uh, I think this kind of rolled into these blue bag lunches. Um, so I don't know if you were at the data symposium, we had one, was it last week? Last week. Last week, and it was very well attended. Uh, Massa and Mike on the team organized it. And it was really to talk about a data ecosystem. And that's something that we in the organization haven't always had. And if any of you have been in the organization any amount of time, data has always been a challenge. Um, one of our colleagues, I don't know if she's here, uh, had talked about data as being the sixth UN language. And I think it's a very interesting and clever way of thinking about it. And I think that's certainly becoming more and more true. Um, I want to just kind of highlight a couple of points. Um, so as we have this increased interest in data, it's not just coming from the UN organically, it's also coming from the Secretary General. At the same time, there's an increased interest in frontier technologies. So we're talking about massive amounts of data, and we're talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, and very, very importantly, 5G is coming as well. So you've got this very interesting time now where not just the UN, but the whole world is being shaped by enormous amounts of data that are now available at speeds that were never available at before and can be processed in a way that was never possible before. I personally think the world is gonna change dramatically in the next 10 years. And I think the two things that are gonna change the world most are artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. And I think the thing that's going to cause them to change, the thing that's gonna start this whole rocket ship taking off is 5G. So this is uh, kind of the time that we find ourselves in. Um, you also know about uh, data in the context of our work in the UN. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, data-driven decision-making. Um, you may be aware also, for example, that uh, organizations like OCHA are very, very uh, um, focused on trying to have a much more predictive uh, understanding of crises. So we're trying to get into this model in the UN of uh, becoming much more uh, data-driven. So with that, I wanted to uh, thank you all for coming. I also wanted to welcome and thank uh, Ms. Mandy Ajwag uh, for uh, uh, being here with us today. Um, she um, has, uh, is here in New York uh, presenting research at the Barclay Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis um, and will be at, uh, at University College London in Columbia University. Um, and uh, you just finished your PhD, congratulations. Thank I think you. it was in August, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, from the University of Sheffield, which is where my sister is from. I uh, was born. So thank you so much for being here uh, and we're very, very excited uh, not just to hear about what you have to say, uh, but also to think about collaborating as we go forward. Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you. So, my name is Lendi Jong. I'm from University College London and uh, I'm very happy to be here again actually to talk about a research topic that I'm passionate about. Um, I used to be an intern at United Nations um, four years ago, and time flies. Um, so um, today, I really want to, to be a very relaxing discussion rather than an academic talk. So if you have any questions, just let me know. So a little bit more about myself. So I'm currently a research fellow at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, University College London. Before that, I used to do work at the L3S Center in Germany, and also the Aaron Turing Institute in the United Kingdom. It's a national center for data science and artificial intelligence. And you know, intern in the United Nations. So a little bit about uh, where I work is uh, physically across the ocean on the other side of the water. And UCL is at London, it's very famous of tea and Harry Potter. <laughs> so the place you are supposed to run through the platform if you have magic powers. So my office is physically close to where the magic happens. However, we're spiritually quite far from the magic world. 
we do scientific research and we're trying to bring more understanding about the world we're living in. So my research interests are very human photos. I look at information retrieval and user engagement, which I probably talk a lot shortly. And I'm also interested in the human in the loop framework. Um, also, I, I have a part of project on spatial analysis and data visualization. We're trying to develop an early warning system for infectious disease outbreaks. And also we want to evaluate. Mm. That's great. Let me give you a little bit of background on the information retrieval and the user engagement first. So, what is engagement? Uh, what is use, uh, information retrieval? So, in a plain word, it's finding material of an uh, unstructured nature to satisfy an information need from a large collection stored on computers, or just say digital collection. And a quick thought about that would be, I have something <coughs> in mind. I want to search for the weather in New York today. And I open Google, I input the keywords in search bar, and Google will give me a list of documents that matches my question. However, a clearly defined goal is not always necessary. Sometimes you just want to browse through some collection and find inspiration. Think about the artist. The artist will want to think what will be the ne next masterpiece. And he opened the Met Museum collection <coughs> the catalog. This is also a vision travel. <coughs> also, the information needs can be expressed in a very different format. It can express it in a question, so it's become a question and answer scenario. It can express it in a chatbot, and the bot is supposed to return an return answer to a specific question. The material that we, that we retrieve can also be very different. Think of a GPS system, and we type in an entity's name, and it returns a geographic coordinates. So it's basically everywhere and it's probably the most frequent thing we do every day during work and in our daily life, personal life. It's very important. So uh, second question is, what is user engagement? Um, user engagement is a quality of the positive user experience when they interact with uh, technology and in, per in particular <coughs> the, the feeling that the user wants to come back to the technology, uh, the technology and stay longer and we always want to ask ourselves why we care about it why engagement matters and let's say in the early days of information retrieval in the 1960s we evaluate the system through algorithm effectiveness. That is to say, we care about how the information needs usually expressed by a query or a question that matches the list of documents. However, the system is built for usage. And it does not really make sense if we don't take care of the interaction between user and the system. We want the service to work and we want the user to know if it works. That's why we need to evaluate from the, as the entire system. Um, user, so why engagement matters in this case is in the recent, age, recent years, we have increasing number of technologies available in the market, and users have increased the expectation of how they interact with the system. But I don't think the developers or the designers of the system really take the user's needs into account. <coughs> they imagine what user wants and they develop a product. And they think, wow, it's great, I love it. However, the user might perceive it from a completely different direction and think, it doesn't make sense. 
<laughs> and, the, and this will result a disengaged user, which is not very happy, and the disengaged user will not continue using the service or system anymore. That's why we need to evaluate information retrieval system and also in a broader way information <coughs> system through user engagement, through the usage. Then I want to talk about the promise of the information retrieval system, what we wanted it to do. So the promise of the information retrieval system, we want them to do to assist human who is quickly access to information. We now have lots of hardware technology, we have phone, we have tablets, we have laptop, we have like um, Siri to help us with everything. It's much faster than we ever think before. We also want the system to reduce the potential information overload. We live in a big, a big data age, and I don't want to look through 100 documents to find the nearest dentist for myself. I want something to give me one result. And it also empowers human with knowledge discovery through the ambassadors we cannot imagine. Like, let's say if I come to New York 10 years ago and I want to find a restaurant, I need to buy a lonely planet and look through the book and think, wow, I might have the chance to get a good one. Now we just open the map and we search for the good top ranked restaurants. You have other customers review to help you make a decision. Good, highly ranked ones are probably good. And that's the mess that's the knowledge we wouldn't have it before. However, this promise will remain actually unfulfilled under the current assessment of user engagement in information retrieval. And it is very sad truth. And we think it is because of three main reasons here. The first part is about the definition of engagement because Engagement is a very multi-dimensional concept and this differs from one service to another. Also, there are problems about the measurement of engagement. How are we going to capture it? Because if we can't quantify, we cannot optimize. And the current measures of the engagement are based on user perception and user behavior. None of them work perfectly. Although there are hypotheses. If we confirm them together, it would have a very good result. But connecting them is also difficult. I'll come back to this point later. Um, the later part is actually the most uh, most important part. It's because in the de in when we do design system design, we do not do it in a systematic way. We actually it's just step into the try and error process. We do not learn from what make it work and what it make it doesn't work. And that is to say, we do not carry on the knowledge about using how to design engaged information retrieval system to our next project. So first of all, definition of engagement. So what do you think would be the components, key components of engagement? Anyone? I'll give a hint. The, the key point is a ring. So, so <laughs> Love you guys. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, the definition of engagement has been a very long topic in the academic, and people has been argue, disagree, agree with each other. Um, so it's basically started from a cognitive psycholo psychology, and um, they say um, in the eighties the first 
raise that. It is a feeling of one is directly manipulating with object addiction. And they also say it's a state of mind that we must maintain in order to enjoy a representation of great action. And in the ninth case, they change the view of describing it. They say we shift the ability of the system to capture users' attention and interests. And then also Webster, when he is analyzing learning, classroom learning with multi multimedia, he said engagement is actually about playfulness. You have someone to feel the single flow. It's very fun and it's engaging. Um, in the new century, um, they say it's a part of usability, perceived usability that encourages interaction. That's emphasized more on the behavior part, how many clicks you make, how long you stay on this service. And they also, they also say it's a very, very user side stuff. It's a feeling of the user that is in control. He can do what he wants to do and when to do it. And recently, the, uh, researchers have emphasized um, knowledge gain, attitude change, attitude change. That means to say the user actually gets something new from the interaction. Um, and the I I think it it all makes sense from case to case. I agree with them. I agree with all of them, and they don't agree with each other. Yeah. But this discussion is very interesting because it results lots of components of engagement that in the industrial and academic level, we talk about attention. We talk about whether the user is very motivated to do things. We talk about novelty because we always want serendipity. Serendipity is a beautiful thing, wanted to happen more. Um, we also, I'll also talk about the perceived usability. However, the engagement model differs from one to another. And how to select the components or how are we going to measure and quantify it remains a big question. So here are some examples about why it differs. So for let's give them C, let's see for games. We want the user to spend a longer time for each visit. We want them to spend a long period. For social media, it's not necessary to stay very long for each visit, but you want them to come back frequently because you want them to read the news feed. For service, let's say searching engine, or not really searching engine, but like a special service, let's say hotel booking system. So booking.com would like the user to think of them first if they want to book a hotel. They don't want them to think about Expedia. They want to be the first thought. And for search, it serves as more like an intermediate stage of everything. They want the user to use them, find the service they want to use, and quickly jump to the other website. They don't want the user to feel, oh, I have to spend so much effort to just get a single piece of information. They don't want it. And we also have a niche that has targeted a very special group of users and want them to come back once a week. And we have the news website that some people, uh, we observe people who have the habit to read news either in the morning or in the evening, but it's very pure, um, periodically. So they're very different from system to system, system to system. And that brings an inherent problem when we try to measure. Because we do not know which one would really work in this case for this system. And also, there are problems about the method we use to measure the engagement. So typically, two types of measures are used when we try to quantify it. One based on user perception, and another one based on user behavior. Neither of them capture a holistic view of engagement. It's because measures of perception are explicit, but obtrusive. And measurements of behavior are more scalable, but implicit. 
But what are user perception and user behavior measures in this case? Um, here's a scenario of a person trying to search something online. And he makes some clicks and he reads through some result pages. The user perception of engagement would, in this case, would be a pop up window saying, Are you happy about the result you are seeing? And the user is supposed to say, Yes, I like it, or No, it's absolutely not. Well, the user behavior measures in this case were from the server side because certain we can't capture how the user is interacting with the system. We can capture their mouse clicks, we can capture their keystrokes, we can even capture their eye movement if we want and they give consent. So it is about, uh, it's a two different types. The the user perception measures are very much loved and the academics are passionate about the providing questionnaires that can capture their defined engagement. So I have listed a couple of them on the, in the table. Um, it is very, it's directly feedback from the user. It's very insightful. However, you do require the user to respond to a number of items, to respond to the question. And I don't think I would even feel like to do so. I don't want to fill a question out with 30 white items while in the middle of shopping on Amazon. Um, and it's really obtrusive, and that's why we have ad blocker to stop them. So it's challenging to scale, because not all the user would respond and in order to get a reliable and a valid questionnaire, we, may, we really need a large sample to test it. Then it's become a chicken and egg question. So for measures based on user behavior, it is also very interesting. Um, the graph shows the heat map of a user use reading a page. And on the left, left hand side is uh, the user is very engaged, is very happy because the result is relevant. And on the right hand side, the user is not very engaged about what he's reading. It's an absolutely random page. <coughs> so we can see the behavior traces as significantly different from one to another. This is because when a user is reading a page, it's like to pay attention. The person tends to do mouse reading, although he's unconscious about that. Well, his, when the user is not really paying attention to what he's reading, the mouse is just flying everywhere. So we can tell, we can actually detect it from the system side of it. However, mapping the behavior signal to the true state of engagement is quite difficult. It is because we do not always have the information we need. Think of the scenario that the person is using a touchpad and does not have a mouse. Then we do not have the mouse traces. We do not have a heat map. And the person stays on the page for 30 seconds. Is he really reading? Or he gets so frustrated and get up to go for a cup of tea and come back. We do not know. Um, this behavior signals are also, are also difficult to extract because it's different from system to system. Some systems want to stay longer, some systems want to click, some systems want to come back more frequently. And that is the drawbacks of user behavior measures. So, we have the hypothesis that if we could link behavior measures with the user perception of engagement together, that is to say, in a case by case context, and we verify those signals with the question that the perception collected, well, that provides us a very easy to collect a section, uh, set of features that we can evaluate our system. Um, we think it will work. 
but it's also very difficult to do and I happen to spend four years of my PhD doing that. Um, it is very um, some of the findings are quite interesting because I try to extract the common patterns of behavior that matches engaged and disengaged users. So what we find is it is very different even we divide it by search task. Let's say a person is doing browsing. <coughs> browsing as you have an undefined goal in your mind. You want to buy a dress, you don't know whether it's red or black or blue. Just open Amazon and you try to look through it. And we find the long staying time on their document page that is a content item. I indicated a high engagement in this case. That means the person is really interested in the document and trying to extract the information, probably making decision making um, in this case. And we also divide the actions into two types. One is called immersion and another is the exploration. Exploration is trying to locate the document you're interested in, and immersion is to reading what's inside. And the alternation of these two types of actions are also indicative for engaged user. Um, another very interesting, interesting observation in that is if a person happened to check multiple pages of the document list, he or she is probably very engaged. Um, an example would be I search cat videos on YouTube and I watch all of them on the first page and I can't help myself. I click the second page, keep watching it. <laughs> Happen to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes with hedgehogs. Yeah. <laughs> um, that also means I'm very engaged. I enjoy this experience and I want to carry it on about the same topic. So we also identify some lower engagement patterns uh, when a person has a clear uh, question in, their, in his mind, uh, which is searching. So we observe that high number of queries without clicks, and very long queries, and long dwell time on the list of documents, not the document itself, but the list. I indicated a not very engaged user. And we kind of related to the sacrifice theory in economy. That when the user has a clear goal in mind, he or she would like to minimize the effort to reach that goal. It's the exactly same thing like I do not want to read a hundred pages. And if he or she is forced to spend much more effort than they would expect it, they are not very happy about that. Um, we also observe a pattern that's got a high uncertainty pattern. That is to say, when a person has a clear goal, like say hotel booking, and then come back and forth, back and forth, multiple times, trying to decide which one to take, but cannot decide, make a decision. It's probably means a very disengaged user. Um, so that is some example. So I want to talk a little bit more about the trial and error process. As I mentioned, it's probably the most important part. That's why the thing is not really working. So first of thing, first thing is, as I mentioned, we talked about we should involve users, we should understand their needs and intents all the time. But the current system design pipeline is actually human out of the loop. So think of who decide the service would be. We have software development developer who write the code. We have project manager tells you <coughs> there are risk and you have to finish it in time. We have your client saying, oh, I need this, I need that fancy carton, and I think that one will be nice. But where are the users? Users are never there. We don't hear their voice or we don't hear them enough. And that leads to a very low success rate, which is an absolutely waste of resources and time.
Another point of um, very often, especially in the industry, we're trying to optimize a single engagement metric a lot. And that will lead to a lot of problems, uh, very undesirable consequences. We are, we probably know about Facebook trying to feed the relevant news to the targeted user group, and this would in reinforce their opinion on a certain topic, leads to polarization. Um, not very desirable. And we also, this thing is not not only for Facebook. And we have Netflix, we know Netflix trying to show post posters based on their user demographic profile. And also in other in other um, <coughs> cases, when we need to use models trying to optimize the system, let's say the other Amazon's recruiting system, they're trying to push male candidates a lot rather than female candidates. And mm. um, this is because we just want to, we either want the user to stay longer and we only want it to stay longer. We don't care about <coughs> what it may lead. It's like leading a donkey with a carrot. Um, the donkey will end up in a field of carrots without the knowledge of there are other vegetables that exist. And that's not something we want. And this failures I conclude in two types. That the failures of the allocation withhold opportunities or resources because we underestimate the other possibilities possibilities of information, of other information, different information. All the failures of representation reinforce subordinary along the lines of identity and stereotypes. We probably don't want that. So that sounds really sad. I spend uh, most of my talk talking about how the promise is not true, how horrible the world is, and what shall we do then? Um, I'm going to talk about and this thing with the future. Like, here, what can we do to help? What can we do to adjust it immediately? So first is, we, can, we should increase understanding of engagement on the, in a context-based fashion. We should always optimize for the right metric. We should thinking about the diversity, thinking about diversification in this case. There were, there were entity, uh, institutes already very interested in that. So this is a case of Spotify. They, are try, they did a very big survey, trying to understand the use cases of uh, their user, and it matches their use cases with their scenario. Let's say the person is very focused. Is he want to, does he does he doing gym? Is he doing study? Is he doing something else? Or the person is more relaxed and it matches into a different scenario. Um, then they optimize this and then they diversify this result by matching slightly different music to the user intent. If the person is slightly relax, then you might want to listen to some music that not is different from what he used to you listen to. And that introduced the novel information into the flow. Um, another point I want to say is about the human in the loop system design, that we need to design features on a need basis, and we really need to understand the user intent, and uh, we're trying to build, we can't, we can't assume the model, the system we build are absolutely right. We have to learn from the user, keep them in the loop. And one of the case, very exciting, is we had this project in the Aaron Turing Institute with Michaela Van der Schaaf, professor in Cambridge. We developed a personalized treatment system for breast cancer. That is to say, there is a machine learning model 
learn from a person's medical history and give the confidence score of okay, you should probably do solution A, B, C, D. But the different part from the other project is we did not we do not present it to the patients. We present it to the clinician and we ask them what do they think in this case. And they do not always agree with the result of the model. And it's absolutely fine. And we ask them second question. Why do you not focus why do you not agree with that? They are the person who interact with patients every day, who has experience of the real world cases, and we trust they will know better. And they input this knowledge, we take the knowledge back, try to fit back the feedback to the machine learning model, and that's a way to get a better estimation of the real world cases. So we keep the model improving. So yeah, that's are the two solutions. These are the two solutions I think might be might be helpful if we want to develop a successful information retrieval system uh, that captures engaged user. And that's probably much of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Spotify, but I'd be interested in what other um, information retrieval systems or platforms that you think are doing a really good job of integrating user feedback and um, kind of um, showing what the, the future could look like. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So yeah, I think there, there, uh, we really we realize this problem uh, so in very recent years, yeah, and lots of people are acting on that. Uh, I just mentioned Spotify because it's something I think is very music retrieval, mm -hmm. very cool. <clears throat> and I think most of them are devoting effort and time in doing that. Facebook is trying to improve as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Kind of related to that question, um, what are some better ways to um, draw out user feedback? You were talking about kind of an exhaustion with completing surveys when you're in the midst of doing something. Um, how, um, what's a better way to either structure the design of surveys themselves or to kind of um, use an alternative approach um, to get that kind of feedback? Yeah, that's a very good question. And this has been a massive pain for my own study as well, trying to get users to talk to you. And uh, in system design, it's always the approximation of what you think it would be and what the user think it would be. So for you, usually a very effective way is to divide it into steps. You never want to reach what they want it to be immediately. So usually do smaller groups, trying to go closer, closer, and uh, you can sample, um, you can give, uh, give invitations to ask them if they want to be more involved, involved into this design of a product. And there are lots of people who are actually interested in contributing to the product development, like the one I mentioned in Spotify. They basically have first the filter, I think so, filter the user that use their service most, like the loyal one, the good user. Not good user, the heavy <laughs> user. Yeah. Um, and they do a send invitations. So, oh, do we want to do a questionnaire or an interview? Maybe come to our office, I'll show you how, how great it looks like, and get lots of feedback on that. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I follow up with could I yeah. part? So, then the, the, the concern will be that what that created bias, right? It because was. basically, you know, we all have mm -hmm. this kind of um, you know, experience. When you do a survey a, a lot of time, especially the, um, in the commercial world, right? Um, the happy customers, they um, don't spend time to, <laughs> to give your feedback, but the, but the very uh, angry ones, they, mm -hmm. they really take time to end up <laughs> how bad the service is. So how do you really, um, you know, differentiate, like, 
identify that kind of you know, user feedback uh, bias in the written work. And then come back to that question is, is it then in, in that context, would that be that it's better to use the behavior, the user behavior factor to, to have the indication of uh, how the user is satisfied? <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. We definitely think uh, we talk a lot about uh, the bias, the sample problem. And it's so classic for math and computer scientists, and it's become a math, like a, a, a something on the back of their head. Is this a true sample? Am I capturing your real feelings? And there are sampling techniques that to deal with this problem. And we're aware of that, and we take up account into training models and such. Um, about uh, behavior signals, I wouldn't say it's a final solution, because it's, it's easy to capture, and it captures the whole population of the user you have. But as I mentioned, it's so different from one system to another, until you verify, until you assume, like, how would the individual user behave? You never really know. And the single behavior signals will never do the job. Like the time spent on a page, is it reading? Is it going to get the P? We don't know. Mm -hmm. So we usually need a combination of features to answer, to help us understand that question. Yeah. I was wondering, do you have any recommendation for measuring uh, website engagement apart from uh, the Google Analytics or having the comments because I mean working in United Nations websites they tend to be a bit not boring but let's say lengthy and like wordy so I was wondering if there was something beyond uh, or, or better ways to use analytics to measure that um, you mean the youth from the behavior usage part or from the, from the behavior and I don't know if perception I mean well I don't know if there are like some questions I don't know if you had any you run into some good ways to measure yeah. the uh, I think for website usage it depends on the function of the website is it for organization website I'm looking for certain policies that applies to the a scenario and if that's the case um, there are design metrics for that. Let's say you want an organization website. You want to look for, oh, am I going to South Africa? Do I need to take vaccine? You want a single answer quickly. So that's a, actually a short stay would be good. But it should need to be uh, discussed on a case by case scenario. And for question now, I my personal favorite would, just, would be the user engagement scale. And that is uh, currently the most uh, tested and verified question now. Um, it's still, the test is still going. We need to verify it with more cases. But I think it's quite nice as it's physically differentiates. Uh, it has six components originally, uh, the first version. It divides engagement to aesthetics that appears and how good it looks. Very important and focus attention and felt improvement, which is a playful and flow theory and novelty and felt here uh, and the perceived usability and ingenuity, which is whether the person feels rewarded, whether it's learned something new and whether he or she will come back and recommend it to someone, oh, this is a really cool thing, you should try check it out. So that one is really nice. And in the later version, they merge the three um, components, which is novelty, felt involvement, and the ingenuity into one small, small component called rewarding. And there is only 12 items, so 12 questions is more, is better than 30. Uh, yeah. But that's my own opinion. Uh, that's not representing all the items. I think that you made a useful distinction between the client and the user. Um, I don't know if you have any uh, best practice that you've seen about how to engage the user um, and in, in the context of the fact that you have a client who thinks they understand the user. Um, how, do you, how do you engage the user either through the client or do you kind of say, no, we need to go directly to the user? I mean, how do you kind of navigate that? <coughs> or, or have you seen any effective teams that have done that? Yeah, um, 
it sounds like I need to talk about their failure, the 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 failed <laughs> cases that I've been through. <laughs> so I think the different um, the difference between client and user I'm not very clear because client is also the user of the service. They want it to work for them. They have their target to achieve. Um, what we I'm I'm a researcher, so I do not do product design that much. I'm trying to understand what engagement is and how we capture, how we autom automatically learn and extract the behavior features from this impression. Um, we just give, um, we do lots of uh, step by step, so mix the method approach. We talk to the, the client, think of what has they target the user, what do they think the user would be, and we combine with the experience that say, okay, this is what you want, and that's what we think you want, and that might be what you really want. And through the iterated discussion, we can have a better estimation of that, and we'll try to encourage them to reach out to get a better idea of what they want. become a kind of guideline for or something can guide us to like when we start deciding from you know to start such a project we have some kind of um, uh, pre-planned uh, process in mind already so that we plan enough time we plan enough steps in order to engage the users yeah. that's a I will or if you have any examples during your research when you're working with So I think the pro process is just to revisit to go and to design again, 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 and uh, do, um, until the point you deliver it. And even yeah. after you deploy the service, you still revisit the go to make it in, in a role. And uh, I have a recent experience because I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to build and evaluate this early warning system for infectious disease outbreak. And uh, we have very different user groups, very different. We have uh, policymakers, we have Department of Health, we have clinicians, we have field workers go to their household and uh, help them to do tests. And we have the general public who are very interested and want to contribute, want to learn more. Uh, what, we, what I did is um, I designed a basic framework, the visualization dashboard, and we took all the different user groups to use it and we're trying to capture which part they are interested most so clearly for department of health they're probably interested in the region which region gets infected more which are on the high risk so we need a map for that and they're also interested in the general descriptive stat statistics like is it going well or is not very well well for the general public they're not they are more interested in a specific day health and what can they do after. So having a link about, let's say we have a, a dashboard about HIV disease and the general public will be interested. Okay, I want to maybe know more about HIV and where can I help them? Is there any fund that I could contribute? Is there any other health information I should know? So having those links, supportive links, would be very good for them. So, but understand what they need. I don't understand what they need at the beginning. I'm, I'm not from a medical background, but it's all through this iterative 
cycles. And <coughs> we get this general framework goes into different small versions. Okay. Um, so I have a question. Uh, just to follow up on what Eugene said, um, actually, uh, I come from a team where uh, most of what we do every day is build dashboards, build get reports, get a lot of heavy data, yeah. and try and build dashboards that can show the most interesting and useful information with the least amount of clutter. So some of the things you say, for example, it's the same thing that we have. Um, maximize engagement by making sure when the user gets in, they're able to see things that are of interest to them and they feel like they've learned, right? While on the other side, reduce clutter, right? Mm -hmm. And we always find the balance between user engagement uh, meaning get things that are interesting to them, especially if there are a lot of users, and reduce the clutter. Don't put more than four charts on one page. A lot of users don't use this. That balance, so getting the balance between listening to too many users and trying to put too much in, and where you strike the balance between them. Because there's also the aspect of the fact that sometimes a user, if, if they provide input and you don't put it in, that is one way of losing engagement. Because mm -hmm. They feel that. So I don't know, I don't know if that's something that you look into in your research where you, what kind of, I know sometimes it might seem like common sense and where to draw the balance, but I'm interested to hear what your experience is with that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, what you described is exactly about the visual information overload. You have too much things colorful and they build, wow, it's so exciting, but which part do I look at? Um, it's a, a scenario we investigate and thanks to the screen, we can swap on. <laughs> that is to say, you can create a small catalog at the beginning. Just usually, uh, not usually, uh, some, some of us do a small catalog. Let's say we have this section about this information, another section about that information. And once the user click it, they quickly jump to the section they're interested in. Then they don't need to see other chat and they don't need to scroll all the way down there. So usually we find the dashboard, the first page. It's like the Google search, no one goes to the second page. If you want to show you, show them on the first page if possible. Mm -hmm. So just basically trying to figure out how to, what you're saying is like this, if you have a lot of information, kind of break it down and mm -hmm. have like the first introduction, a yeah. small summary, and then go into that. But also if you want to basically just, you have one screen, imagine you can't scroll, you try to maximize both engagement and um, and, and, and reduce clutter. Just some of the tricks you would use to, I guess what you said was wrong, but just, I'm just curious. I mean, maybe it's just, I think this is everyone gets half and half, you know, yeah. I would say, uh, then especially for dashboard design, and the dashboard they should serve, or generally, should serve as a purpose. So what you want to tell the user you're telling about uh, the infrastructure of something, or you're telling about the progress report of a project, something like that. And there's a decision what you think would be most important to put on the first page. And yeah, so as I mentioned, if you want to provide more detailed information, it's usually just a, a click button change to another section of their page. And basically, that can uh, zoom into a rabbit hole rather than prevent lots of things at the beginning. Um, I, I was just thinking aloud just now when, when I was listening to you guys. I'm just wondering, right, like, um, you know, are we really talking about different layers of the information, right? And because we do have a lot we need to provide to our users, or especially these high-level users, they don't have the time and they don't have patience, they need to get to what they are looking for immediately. And then uh, it needs to be interesting also, right? So then it, it becomes um, a decision making for us um, or by understanding those layers to say, how do we layer the presentation of the information in a way that will present the overall look first? You, you, because you cannot afford missing any part. All of this part needs to be presented in one go to provide one overview, right? So you present the overview either higher level first, but with an interesting way, and then to um, attract them to drill down to the specific section. Maybe, you know. Yeah, you know, the tricks you use, for example, right. uh, the, the idea that 
the human eyes and read in a zigzag. Yeah. You know, start with here, go here, mm -hmm. and go down. So if there is something, and then the second thing you have to try and see is minimize clicks. Right. Try and get information exactly. the least number of clicks. So if there is something you're sure that will they will invest in more by clicking, you can right. put it there and then give the more information that comes with it. Right. And then just put it. And then really, at some point, it has to be just about um, decide right. how many things you're going to put and cut the rest off. Just prioritize. Yeah. If you try and fit everything in one page as we found, you know, you you will see nothing. If everything is in front of you, you generally see nothing. Yeah. Except the one or two people who are so invested in the technical and they come in and they know exactly where they want to go. On yeah. a particular day. And yesterday I, I listened to one of this uh, presentation in this um, um, behavior um, insight based presentation. So presented organized by this uh, innovation network. Um, and then that presentation is very interesting by a, um, a chief of the BI, some kind of BI unit in the World Bank. And that person is specialized as a behavior science um, expert. He's a he was a PhD in that area and, and then he's applying the you know behavior science research result to the World Bank's projects, you know, in relation to the SDG goals. And he gave some very interesting, um, uh, introduced the interesting way that they tested the users. You know, the users they're working the, during the project is the same if you want to re re receive um, a, a goal um, by disseminating the information data, but twice different ways of disseminating. Yeah. yeah, and then because the different ways based on the behavior science. Um, model behind it to see what kind of psychology and you know, contingent behavior science kind of um, principle behind it and you tailor the, 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 the same message in a different way then you impact how the user receive it um, and how the user being changed or impacted by this data or information it's a very interesting that that's also a part of the you know um, a type of user engagement, and it's a very interesting uh, presentation. But I think they do have they do have videos that we can take a look again together. Sorry <coughs> to take a second question, yeah. but it's related to this discussion we're having yeah. on users. Um, so you mentioned the development of uh, use cases and optimizing for different profiles of users. I wonder if that's a potential solution to this issue. If you have different kinds of users, some of them who might know exactly where they want to go and know how to scroll down to get there, but most of whom who are exploring for the first time would have difficulty, but then you want to kind of design it so that the most important people you know, get the information that you need. Is there a way that you can design use cases and then in the case of Spotify, it would cater to the listening interest, but in this case, it would ca cater to the information interest of, of whoever arrives on the dashboard. Like, how would you use like a use cases to, to change the design of the dashboard? Yeah, I think that's uh, actually, uh, to understand the use cases, it's using use cases is trying to understand their true intent. Like, are they just there, feel it's fine and want to know more, or they're trying to figure out the specific numbers or information? So, yes, the short answer is yes. To, it is a way to do that. Yeah. I think the solution that was offered before actually does make sense. You just have to be careful how you choose. Um, try and put a summary of everything in the front where without clutter, where whoever wants or needs, if I'm looking for particular information on one case, I get the summary and if I want more, then I go into more detail. So you create a lot of pages at the back, but at the front you make it as simple as possible while trying to include everything. It's usually just a balance of the two. Just like you initially have said. Yes, I, to, to this question, I don't uh, groups or resources that you recommend 
I mean, smiling, so I guess that's yes. For, for people who work on this, they're just constantly um, staying in the loop. Yeah. 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 So I would think, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like shamelessly recommend my supervisor's book because they <laughs> sound like conflict relations. Um, it's okay. <laughs> so this, those books are more from a cognitive psychology branch. So I was forced to buy to own some of them. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think why Indie Dramatic is by Heather Auburn as they're probably the very good read about how different so they talk about how indigenous may differ from different things and it's attractive chapters from lots of scholars, quite nice as a thing to read. And I specifically recommend a book by Monia Lemus. Uh, she writes her a book, I think the title is called Measuring Engagement. Um, that's uh, that was st uh, started as a tutorial at the uh, conference, and it was so successful, and I got invited to write this book. Um, I think that one is probably uh, the best read if you want to know about how to measure and how which one to pick and how we're going to act tomorrow. buy or, or, or take, make use of the existing exam, uh, existing model, like right? <laughs> if it's validated and, you know, and then, you know, it works for organization like us and we can just borrow it directly. Um, you know, is there any place for us to find out, you know, uh, the validated model existing um, um, that we can just go to take a look and to see whether or not it apply to our work instead of design it from scratch. Yeah, that's very, that's a uh, very interesting question. So looking for the models that suit your use cases mm -hmm. is uh, exactly trying to understand engagement on, in a complex space. Right. And I guess it depends with what kind of service you want. Mm -hmm. If the service is well applied in the industrial side, as you want the search engine, you have like a benchmarks of Google, Bing, etc. If you want to find a chatbot, then really sorry, they're not much to compare with, compared to. Um, so it really depends the depends on your system you want to build, and it never hurts to have a discussion with people who know it. Yeah, no one have a chat with you. <laughs> <laughs> Just one quick question. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on colors and what colors are used to make this meaningful? Yeah. Engagement and yeah. Yeah. Wow, the top secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so color is very, very um, important when you de um, design visualization and trying to catch people's attention. And there were massive massive literature on that. So you have this um there's a vi the IEEE VIS, which is a conference. They do massive discussion. And my favorite is basically depends so the thing is you do not want it to only catch a user, only want it to, to match what you want to say. So it's usually how we were trying to match the organization's same color, and a lot of companies have their color books. They're trying to select around that, and there were lots of design principles around around if you have like three principal color, how to select a out of them. Yeah. Can you research um, if there is a system? Um, for information search mostly for information that users um, don't like at all. They have no choice but to use it because it's the only system. Now, <laughs> you would like to do something to actually change the view and um, increase the engagement. Yeah. Right? 
because it's also, you know, the user interaction with such system, and actually we're talking about the particular system that we use here in the world. <laughs> it's also important because users are part of those who are feeding information to the system, right? So if they don't feed information, then you don't really get good results of the search, right? Yeah. Um, if you wanted to do something to increase their engagement, is the rebranding kind of and um, creating a dashboard on top of the system that would be different um, a good idea? Mm. <laughs> so yeah, I so like turning user attention away from the system that they dislike to something else that maybe they would like more. <laughs> I would, I would usually wouldn't recommend a job like here when they get a new bone mm -hmm. solution, and then think improving a system. All the system come out, like appear from scratch. They were never great at the beginning, mm -hmm. and. Branding and improving should be a, uh, it's just a uh, nature philosophy we have in mind. The user have to accept that. Um, let's see. I'm not talking about the system you are talking about. I don't know which one, but for the ones I have experienced, let's say the National Health Service in in England. Mm -hmm. If anyone happened mm -hmm. to know, it used to be awful. Okay. Yes. And what they did, they have beta system. Um, mm -hmm. So the old one still working, the new one using their same infrastructure, mm -hmm. but a very very different uh, interface mm -hmm. and very nice design. And uh, these two systems are running at the same time. Well, when you add, when you visit the first one and say, please try the other one, mm -hmm. we're not going to we're not going to work mm -hmm. in like thirty or whatever days, and kind of dilute user to the other in, other interface and help them to improve. When they think it's quite stable, they just bye bye yeah. the other one. And that's a smooth change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, actually, I'm just thinking. Are you saying that you know a lot of time um, you know the system and stuff, the functionality is not really work, but it's just really use this basic user interface to work with it to make sure it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the combination of those two. Well, so basically, basically, what it means is um, uh, kind of what 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 I thought when I asked the question that it's very difficult to change user's perceptions, right? Yeah. And uh, the perceptions influence the engagement. So if they perceive the system as awful and difficult to use, it would be difficult to change their perception rather than just putting something more appealing on top of it. That would seem to be the best. But eventually, it comes down to the backbone is the usability issue, right? You know, that there is a fun functionality and then there are usability, yeah. And if all the functionalities are there, then the usability yeah, is key. Yeah, but yeah. if the functionality it is having, well. yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. So you don't have to be engaged as well. Right, if we still have time. <laughs> okay. Um, so I um, I wonder. I'm really fascinated by the use of um, client feedback throughout the entire process, like from conception of a project and then testing beta, a beta version and getting feedback after a launch and continue. Like this is a continual process of improvement. Um, and I wonder, like. Could you give us a sense of like a methodological approach to doing that, like involving users at every step? Um, and also, again, to go back to use cases, like how you would approach developing use cases, like uh, I guess you would have focus groups to determine whether your assumptions about the different user profiles are correct or that kind of advice. Yeah, sure. So I guess there are, um, this, um, including user feedback in the system has already de uh, deployed in lots of real world cases, and, uh, and my ultimate uh, research um, goal is to provide adaptive system that adaptive to users' needs on a real time basis. So currently, adaptive systems in the in the market, if you think about the recommendation system. You have Netflix, they tell you, okay, you might be interested in three movies today. Mm. And it's very simple. It's basically one feed, a label 
like three items. If you like it, it's fine. If you don't like it, it's still fine. The interface doesn't change. The other information doesn't change. That's very nice. Um, to to create a truly adaptive system is a difficult question. It's an open question. We still do not have an answer. How we learn the true intent on the automatic, automatic and ongo in like an ongoing way is difficult. Um, but the uh, uh, answer to your another question is saying, is there any methodology I would apply if I'm trying to tackle certain use cases? Um, is you come to or uh, you start as a, de a design without any hypothesis, without any targeted user, and you talk to people, talk to people who truly need the service to sculpt, um, to form what the user look like. Yeah. And basically, I know nothing at the beginning. Um, if we don't have any more questions, and thank you everybody for coming, mm -hmm. and thank you Mandy for a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, we uh, are going to share this uh, presentation. We have her presentation details also uh, with everyone, um, and then uh, you can feel free to share with your colleagues if you think people who benefit from it. And um, this uh, workshop is uh, actually is. Um, uh, an ad hoc workshop because if she happened to be here we see let's do it uh, you know take the chance of the time of her being here but then uh, we feel like it's not a bad idea for us to have a continuous it's a series of such kind of workshop to uh, have us to um, you know open our uh, eyes and what's happening in in this world <laughs> <laughs> and especially everybody not data is a buzzword um, so if you have any suggestions or you have any um, connection or researcher you know that you want to uh, introduce to us so we can organize an ongoing workshop like this, please do uh, let us know, contact us, and you have our contact email in this meeting invitation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.